So I'm Margaret McPherson and I'm a research associate at the Centre for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children at Western University and I work closely with Barb McQuarrie on all kinds of things and um, I'm very grateful to be here today and to have you all here and the person who's timing me has left the room which might be bad for you. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> She'll come in. Um, so I'm just going to do a really quick um, sort of overview for you about the Make It Our Business training program that we have been uh, working and introducing to employers. Okay, Marilyn, you can't sit in the light, though. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, okay. It always takes a minute, right, to get yourself kind of situated in the room. So I'm just going to talk about um, Make It Our Business, which is our workplace domestic violence training program. I want to hit some of the high points for you just to talk about the program and sort of our big ideas when we started out in terms of what we think everybody needs to know about domestic violence in the workplace. Now if I stand here, I'm in like totally people's way, right? So if I stand here, that's probably why the lectern is here. Um, and so all of our work starts from uh, an evidence base that comes from the Domestic Violence Death Review Committee in Ontario, where they started looking at domestic homicides um, and found very early that it's always the people right around a situation who know what's happening, but they don't know what to do about it. And so how do we prepare people to uh, recognize what's happening and then to take action in a way that's safe and effective? This is the national study that you saw talked about this morning. I'm not going to spend any time on it, but really it, this study is what has allowed us to bring the issue home in a meaningful way uh, for employers and workers um, to really, you know, sort of we have to wake up in terms of how prevalent the issues are and take very practical steps. So the, the survey's been very important in helping us understand sort of the scope of the problem and how people are experiencing it. So you've seen these numbers, right? That there's about a third of workers and over 50% of those are experiencing domestic violence at work. Quite a high number, 35% know someone. So the co-workers are the people right around the issue who are most likely to, you know, see what's happening. And so why wouldn't we want to, okay, I won't do that again. Why wouldn't we want to prepare them to, um, you know, to take action when they see it happening? Uh, gender Gender-based violence, gender uh, violence happens for men and women quite differently. And um, so men are experience the highest overall rates of violence and they're most likely to be killed by another man. Women are more at risk of domestic violence, sexual assault and harassment. And they experience the most serious injuries and are more likely to be hospitalized from injuries. They're more li likely to be killed by a partner or ex-partner in Ontario, the 2017 uh, Domestic Violent Homicide Review showed that 97% of the perpetrators were male and LGBTQ people experience higher rates of domestic and sexual violence. So gender is an important issue. And if we're going to be effective in our, you know, sort of in how we're responding, then we have to understand gender differences in both people who are experiencing and perpetrating the violence. It comes to work in this way, right? So abusive phone calls, text messages, stalking and harassment behavior, the partner may come to the workplace, email messages, contacting coworkers, supervisors, complaining, asking where they are, things like that. Disclosures are one of the most important pieces, so this is where we see that it's the coworkers, right? Supervisors, managers are the people who most generally know what's happening. This is a quote from the study. The idea of sharing what's happening in the situation, it, you know, can be quite um, alarming, scary, but people have found that the workplaces often can be the most sort of secure place, safe place, supportive place for people to find what they need. We know though that generally speaking, people are unprepared to respond and that people have been killed at work. So these are 
the big ideas that we're working with, teach everyone in an organization to recognize warning signs and risk factors and then how to respond safely and effectively. Depending on where you are in an organization, you have different levels of responsibility. But the idea that it starts from a, a general ability to recognize what's happening requires a whole company approach. So it can't, sort of the education can't just sit at the higher levels. You really have to drive it right through the organization so that everybody has a comfort level and a sense of confidence about what to do when they see things happening. But first of all, to be able to know what when they see something that makes them feel uncomfortable. So the big idea is around challenging and changing social norms. These are workplace warning signs. So this, as, as I said, this is just a little look inside some of the training that we do. So workplace warning signs are a little bit different from what we talk about in the community um, because they're more likely to show up as work performance issues. I've had many HR directors come to me and say, you know, we're disciplining this woman right now. I need to go back and have a different kind of conversation with her because her work performance may be related to her home situation. Gail, you got a minute? Sure, what's up? I noticed you signed in late again tonight. Oh yeah, I got uh, stuck in that traffic. There's construction on That's the... That's not the only thing that concerns me. I've been looking over your attendance for the last three months. You've used all your sick days, and then some. And then there's your husband. What about him? There have been several complaints about him haranguing the front desk staff, showing up here all hours. He just really worries about me when I work late. It's not just when you work late. I saw him out there yesterday afternoon when you picked up that early shift. I'm sorry. He, um, he's been out of work, so it's been real tough on him. And you, I'd imagine. I'm not sure what to tell you, Gail, but your performance is starting to negatively affect our residents, and... That we can't have. I understand the other night when you were on the phone with your husband, Mrs. Price was left waiting in her wheelchair for over an hour. So do whatever you have to do. If you need to get some help, talk to somebody or take some time off, please do so sooner rather than later. Okay? Have a good night. You too. So what do we see happening in this situation? Right, there's a number of warning signs. Third time this week you've been late, you've used up all your sick time, you're not doing your job. You need to fix this. And so this is a supervisor who, who is able to recognize what he's seeing, but he uh, is not attaching the meaning to it. And he's also not um, uh, understanding his responsibility. What will happen next? What do you think is most likely? Is she going to start? Is she going to tell her husband to stop coming to the workplace? Is she going to start to hide what's happening? Could she lose her job? Like these are all possibilities. I think it's most likely that she's going to start to hide what ha is happening, which is a real problem for everyone. If she, if she, you know, it seems like she's in an escalating situation, and so the last thing we want is for her trying to manage all of that and not let anybody know what's happening for her to protect her job. Right? So that's kind of, there's, the, there's a lot of the pieces that are kind of coming together in this little situation that we, um, you know, need to prepare people to be able to take action when they have that insight into what is it that's going on. Recognizing risk factors are a little different than warning signs in the sense that uh, warning signs are like a red flag. It doesn't automatically mean that abuse is happening. Um, but risk factors in the presence of a domestic violence situation tell you that the situation's acts escalating. So this is what Peter spent a fair bit of time talking about, the risk factors and the importance of recognizing risk factors. And this supervisor actually was able to name a number of the risk factors, haranguing the front desk staff, he's showing up here at all hours and he's calling you. And then Gail added another piece where she said he's been out of work. 
So these are all sort of check marks on this list of, these are some of the top, uh, sort of the most reoccurring risk factors in domestic homicides. And so, you know, he's already ticking some of the boxes there. And so the supervisor, the missed opportunity is for him to understand the meaning of what he's seeing in the context of domestic violence. He's naming it, but he doesn't understand what it means. And so there's the missed opportunity to, for something to happen. And so we use a conversation framework to help people have that conversation that's difficult. We recognize, right? Most of us are trained to mind our own business. What goes on in a home is private. This is like centuries of training that we have to overcome. And so it takes courage to have a conversation with someone that says, I see what's happening to you, I'm concerned about you, what can I do? So this is the framework that you, we use, see it, name it, check it. It's like three steps. You see what's happening, things that make you feel uncomfortable, you pay attention to them. You're going to name the warning sign, the concern, and then you're going to take a step back and ask questions, right? Because you don't actually know. We don't want people jumping to conclusions. This isn't about you know, charging off to save the day at all. It really is about a thoughtful, sensitized approach to what people are experiencing with uh, real questions, but also based on what do I actually know about this situation? See it, name it, check it. The whole point of the conversation is not to solve the situation, but to open the door for support, to make it more likely for her to tell you what's happening Right? And whether or not the supervisor is the best person to have the conversation, you know, these are sort of the, the questions that come up. But are there people who can talk with her? Because remember, if it's the people right around the person who's experiencing the abuse or perpetrating the abuse who have the sort of the front row seat to it, they're the people that we want to prepare to have the conversations. So let's give him another chance. I'm sorry, he's... Uh... He's been out of work lately, so it's been real rough on him. And you, I'd imagine. I hope you don't mind me saying so, but I'm a little concerned about you. The way your husband's acting isn't healthy. His keeping tabs on you when you leave the house, calling to check up on you while you're here. And he's out of work, and... Uh, I know he's going through a rough time, but I have to make sure that you're okay through all this. So I think the best way forward would be to get in touch with Yasmin in HR. She can work with the Health and Safety Committee and the local women's shelter and do a risk assessment. It may be overly cautious, and I hope it is, but that way, you have a safety plan in place, if and when you need it. So I'll give her a call as soon as I get back to the office, and I'll, uh, I'll make sure that she checks in with you before you finish up your shift tonight, okay? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if they'll put it up on the, it's part of the live presentation. I think that's quite possible. I would have to ask about it though. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about that after. So, you know, a, a lot of people will criticize him. He talked the whole time, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe he didn't go about it in the best way, but he went about it in the way that we've asked him to. He named what he saw. He was naming the risk factors. And at the very end, he did take the step back and say, okay. So it'll look like, it'll look different for everyone. But the real important question is here is what is the impact? Do you think the door is open for Gail? to take the step to, you know, maybe talk with someone about what's happening so that there can be some safety planning, a risk assessment can be done. This is all about relationships and about opening the door for, for things to happen. Support is important because she's trying to manage on, this, on her own right now and she's more likely to be honest if she believes the support is genuine. And as the situation changes, you want her to be talking about what's going on. 
So these big ideas like start with teaching everyone to recognize warning signs and risk factors, how to drive that through the organization as part of the practical application that Marilyn's going to talk about. And the other piece is about taking a whole company approach because we need to take more of a, a sort of an ecological view on violence. It's not just an individual issue. It happens, you know, violence in relationships happens in a constellation of other relationships around them in the organizations and communities and societally. So when we change the law at a societal level to address domestic violence specifically, it's going to have implications all the way through to the individual level. And vice versa, things that happen in individual lives happen because of the constellation of the ecology around us. There are environments where it's more or less likely that violence or harassment may or may not happen. What are the conditions that make it? more and less likely. This is the learning journey that we've embarked on together. Part of the problem with looking at the individual in isolation is this is something that happens to some people is that what we inevitably end up doing is having this kind of conversation that she allows the situation to happen so we blame her for being in a violent situation and in a workplace the danger of her becoming the problem that has to be solved is a serious one. And then we write him off as if we could vote him off the planet and that would be the end of our problems, right? So I think that we have to take a bigger view and a whole company approach is part of seeing yourself as being part of a much bigger picture where little things that people do can make a big difference. These things relate to, like everything is interconnected and interdependent and so we have to be able to understand that the thing that I do matters and, that, and the place that I occupy in an organization, my position, I have the opportunity to make changes, to be in a way that allows for good things to happen. Everybody has a responsibility in the system, right? Everybody has a responsibility to keep each other safe in workplaces. And we want to nurture this culture of open communication because it's based on the sort of what I call the human being approach where we're not just you know learning how to tick boxes on issues we're actually engaging with people this is sort of one of the fundamental sea changes that comes with legislation it's an opportunity for people to step up as human beings and connect with each other and make it more likely that people actually feel supported get support and make the changes that they want so two frameworks we work with at the level of the human being, we want to prepare everyone to recognize warning signs and risk factors. We work with this conversation framework under sort of the idea of respond. The big sort of organizational framework is recognize, respond, and refer. Everybody needs to have the skills that are attached to uh, each of those um, uh, skills and abilities to be able to protect and support workers. This is just our whole company approach, sort of how we envision engaging people, different levels of education, uh, working with senior teams, working at the individual level. Due diligence is possible with domestic violence. Yes, it's a different kind of hazard, but you have a critical event, somebody sees it, the person closest to the situation has a sync at conversation where risk factors are determined to exist. And, we understand, yes, it's a situation of domestic violence. It goes to whoever's responsible for safety, who's going to do safety planning, threat assessment, risk management, and monitoring, sort of risk management on an ongoing basis, and work with experts. There's no expectation that employers have to become experts in domestic violence. You have lots of support in your communities, in the, in the shelter system and other victim uh, service groups that you can build relationships with in a proactive way. They're your partners. They can help you. I want to say one thing about the compassionate workplace and the idea of a big tent issue. There is more and more research you know, that just supports the idea that um, uh, you know, it, it makes sense on a dollar, a dollar <coughs> basis. There is a, 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 a benefit to investing in this kind of training and education for your people. Um, and there's research coming that actually quantifies it more specifically. Doing nothing is not an option, right? The lack of response condones and rewards violence explicitly or implicitly. It costs us not to deal with it. So we want to work together, create environments where we can support each other in figuring out how to 
um, you know, create the best possible workspaces so that everybody has an opportunity to contribute to the well-being of their organization. These are brochures that are available on our website. That's a quick walkthrough on my part. I'm going to call Marilyn up and she's going to talk about, we've worked together uh, when Marilyn was at Mount Sinai Hospital and so if you want to introduce yourself, Marilyn, you have your own, you come up here. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to see folks here today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually operationalized a program to address domestic violence in a fairly large workplace. Um, my experience comes from both having worked at a community college and then for the, uh, until about three quarters of a year ago, um, working at a very large Toronto urban teaching hospital um, with around, by the time I left, around 7,000 employees at least 75% of whom are women. So um, some of you may be in similar kinds of workplaces, you may be in smaller places, and just share a little bit with you about what I learned around what can be helpful around that. When I first was in the hospital, I had come from a college where we did safety planning with students quite regularly around uh, sexual violence and uh, domestic violence, and had a situation quite early on where someone came in and said that they were experiencing domestic violence, was having an impact on their work. Nobody really understood that. She was being quite ostracized in the workplace, and called security and said, oh, I need you to come up. We're going to do a safety plan. And they said, what's a safety plan? So that's kind of where we started, and I think it's a, it's a really key place for all of us doing this work is, can we, you know, do we have resources? Do we have the knowledge to do safety planning in our workplace, which, you know, to be quite honest, is not that difficult to do because you will know the risks in your own workplace. You'll know where people can have access, how they can um, enter the organization. Uh, you can develop protocol around how to protect people if somebody calls asking for them from outside. So those are the kinds of things that we kind of started with thinking about and where I was delivering a lot of that one-on-one um, -on -one and continue to do that for some time. I also want to acknowledge a lot of this work was done with a colleague of mine, Narina Nagra, as well as um, people in the community and the and the folks and actually Margaret came and trained us all for at least two days wasn't it, it was two day training actually, three days yeah they were so we we got a group of folks within the organization both those of us who were working internally to work with staff but also those who were working with patients who then became also good resources for all of us to pull into the work that we were doing with staff and sometimes staff were patients and that is also sometimes the way that um, domestic violence can be detected and people can get hooked up with resources within the organization. So I'm not going to use a lot of my slides. Oh no, how do you do this? The green button? The green button. All right. Because um, Margaret has touched on those, but you may not know, all know, you may know uh, we've been talking about, um, and I just went totally blank here. Sorry for what's <laughs> Laurie Dupont, but we a lot of you may not have heard about Alana Frick, and and Alana Frick is a physician was a physician, um, and it's almost been two years since her body was found in a suitcase, and um, she had been through blunt force trauma and strangulation had been killed, and actually in a, about a month the trial of her husband, who has been charged, who is also a physician, um, is uh, going to begin. Out of that, and it's very interesting, I think, and maybe typical of human nature, that we are very affected by people who are like us who have an experience. And for physicians who worked in, in their separate organizations and who, you know, knew them and knew there were issues that were happening in the relationship over a period of time, they were left going, what could we do? That's something we don't want every, anybody to wake up to. We don't want anybody to be saying, what could I have done? What should I have done? And you know, maybe people did everything they possibly could. But it opened up an opportunity, and I think, uh, you know, Peter Jaffe was talking today about why we look into these situations and these issues to engage physicians in a very different way around domestic violence because they wanted to be supports to each other. They wanted to recognize if something like this was happening around them. They supervise students, they supervise residents, they're, they have staff who work, you know, they're administrative staff, they work with nurses, et cetera. So 
those are very they're very complex environments where lots can be happening and so th there are one course that's mandatory for all physicians in teaching hospitals it was on privacy and they now have a second course so I'll just show you a little bit about that course but I think it's worth thinking about who are the subpopulations within your organization how would you approach them to engage them around this work and would you do it all, you know, the same across the organization? Because I can tell, unfortunately, a terrible incident can also be um, an opportunity to bring people into this work in a way that, you know, that they feel very affected by. This is a little schema that <laughs> I thought might be helpful as we talk about how do you actually do this work. And, and the first thing is to make a case. And we've seen a lot of statistics around making the case, and those are very useful. Because in spite of all that we know and we hear about domestic violence, it's still seen by many of us, and you know, I find my brain sometimes going there, to, as a personal issue. It's a relationship issue. We're saying this is a workplace issue. It's a workplace issue. This comes into the workplace, and that video is so great at just showing some of the ways that that actually happens. Didn't you just want him to sit down, though? Didn't we? Just sit down. <laughs> Get some eye contact happening here. Um, but great for you know, great to share with people around training. So we're making the case in all kinds of ways, and I, I don't want to show you more of those, but you've seen them. Use those statistics. Help people to understand the impact on workplaces and how we can take care of each other as a community. This is, working in workplaces is about culture change. It's about creating a culture where this is not acceptable. And where everybody understands that if someone says, oh, I don't want to go to HR, I don't want to go to the human rights office, that's not on. That's not on. And that can be very hard for lots of us. And for particularly for women, you know, for people who are committed around a lot of the ideals that come out of the women's movement, which is women should be in charge, they should, you know, not be forced to do things, there's a place for us at least requiring a safety conversation and where we put some things into place because this is about also not having that violence come into the hospital or the organization, sorry. It's also about, not, uh, about us taking care of the people who work with us. And, and work in that organization. We have a responsibility to them. And that's that individual who's experiencing violence, but it's also to anybody who may be affected by that, should the perpetrator come into the workplace and also, you know, maybe disappear because they're very upset or they're trying to deal with an issue and leaving other folks with, you know, perhaps really risky work that they're doing without their colleagues. So there are many, many reasons, but um, it's a bit of a dilemma when you want self-determination for people, but you're also really requiring people to engage at least in safety planning. And we can do so much more than that, as well as you'll see with some of the, the program. Conducting a risk assessment, uh, safety planning, and risk management is that really other important piece. The materials that they have on uh, making it our business are so helpful and useful. Um, I would hold up the brochure, but in, I'll sh yeah, I can show you some. I think these are the old ones, so I better not <laughs> do that. But we put together packages. In these packages, you can put all of those brochures. They're ready and made. We had lots of them. We do a lot of this work. Um, and the more that you get that word out, and the more that you bring everybody into that community, you will have more and more disclosure. I was actually really surprised when Bill 168 came in in Ontario, which required workplaces to take on a lot of this work. I thought we were doing a lot of safety planning. We probably went from two safety plans a year immediately to about 20. Um, so that's, that's the importance of this, is just normalizing it, letting people know that they're welcome to seek help and there'll be no judgment. We're not going to tell people to leave their partners. We're not going to tell them to even leave. We're going to really focus on their safety and support them through that journey. That might take one or two visits with them or meetings. It may take years where we are constantly dealing because the harasser continues to find their phone number or the, and sends them harassing text messages or is stalking them in the community even after years. Um, so there's, you know, we establish a relationship and we continue to support that person until they no longer need that and, and we look at that. Sitting down with uh, somebody who's experiencing domestic violence and reading through the warning signs can be quite a profound realization for them. These, because what they're gonna start to say, and you're nodding so you know, they're gonna, 
that's happening to me, that's happening to me. When they know that seven warning signs is what is basically um, the, uh, underlies a lot of the homicides, that can be very awakening for them as well. Denial of what's happening makes a lot of sense. Who wants to feel they're in danger? Who wants to feel that the person, you know, someone who is close to them and who they have you know, perhaps children with or perhaps a life with, um, could possibly seriously, seriously harm them. But we have to have that conversation. It's really important. This is why the safety planning. So we sit down, we look at those risk factors and, and you know, try to bring the situation really to life for them and also develop a plan. So I actually, um, I'll show you a few things that could go into a safety plan that you might want to think about. They also have great materials on the website, a really nice little called individually individualized workplace domestic violence safety plan so if you want to just you know you can t oh it's accepted so on all these i would show you but anyway if you want to see it i'll show it to you no i'm talking about making it our business website I'll sorry who the, yeah I'll sorry yeah that margaret was talking yeah. about that wonderful program rich with terrific resources and then you can customize them for your own organization um, we also developed a, a list of resources that i'll share with you sort of some of the kinds of things that you can make sure you have in that in this package that you can share with them right so what are some resources in the community how do they contact their local police station so they might be able to come and go here's where you need some lights this is where you need an alarm etc so that they can help them to to become um, you know safer Educating on all rights, responsibilities, policies, and processes. So how many of you have a domestic violence policy? Okay, great. <laughs> so th that's a good place to start. And you bring together people in the organization who can work with you on that. So whether that's if you have occupational health and safety, you have HR, you have maybe women who are have some expertise or people who have expertise around domestic violence you might want and also to consider um, intersectionality which I want to talk about so make sure you have really broad representation from people who have different uh, lived expertise uh, in the community including trans people and uh, indigenous people and racialized women and maybe women who've come as immigrants etc so you can get make sure that we're you're developing a plan and processes that are going to be accessible feel welcoming safe for everybody. And um, the education piece, as I said, we had you know, a fair bit of that. We did it constantly, like constant education. When we had opportunities to meet with large groups of workers in the organization, we would, like if there were education days, we made sure we were there. Um, you, can't, you can't stop doing it. Um, because of course employees change and people forget about it and other priorities come up and you have to keep it in, in front of people in all kinds of ways. Um, we did posters, um, a lot of, uh, again, materials that were visual throughout the whole organization. And I'll show you a little bit about those. And then you have to keep monitoring, adapting the safety plan. So we're going to meet weekly <coughs> or we're going to meet monthly. Um, the manager has a very key role in this and they must know. So in terms of confidentiality, what we had decided was manager needs to know, you know, our group, which was human rights, um, occupational health and safety had to know as well and security had to know we would usually ask for a photograph of the individual and then we would only circulate that as needed and we wouldn't necessarily say who or why we just say if you see this person and they enter this space you pick up the phone you call security we had secret word like secret code words for security as well you might want to think about that um, so if somebody can't pick up the phone and say you know my ex is standing right in front of me and he's not in them very frightened you could just say whatever you want to use as a code word, right? Oh, could you please bring me the whatever, or I need a, or something like that. So just to think about some of the things you can do. The other piece is how people travel to and from work. And if you have on-site security, can they go and help people to reach the building after they get off a subway or a bus stop? Can they get escorted to their um, automobile in a parking garage at night, for example? And the other thing to, you know, to really emphasize to people is if you feel yourself feeling embarrassed to ask for help, one, you're saying, I really would like some help right now. I would like an escort or I would like somebody to help me to do. So definitely don't hesitate to ask and really encouraging people to do that. Stickers on the phones. 
are a way for people to remember what the number is they need to call if there is an emergency or if they do feel threatened. So just kind of thinking very broadly around what might, you know, what are the, where do people move in this organization? What kinds of security or safety is already in place? You may not have on-site security, so you may um, have the, you know, the number for police. Um, it's up to the individual in our situation about involving police, but you may not have large supports in your organization, so it may be important for you to call them, to have conversations with them. Also, um, in the past, have used a threat assessor in very, very serious situations that I was worried, is there anything we haven't thought of? Have we done everything? And there's a, an awesome person speaking this afternoon, actually, Tracy Marshall, who does a lot of that threat assessing and you know doesn't have to be on site. So I just, if you want to learn a bit more about that, you have an opportunity then. How am I doing? Time-wise. I'm done? No, no, you're okay, okay, good. <laughs> I finished? Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk. So making the case, we've talked about just making sure that people know what domestic violence actually is. So I'm going to whip through these. You know, this is kind of, oopsie, I want to go back one. This is, you know, just again to say, this was in the, uh, I think it was in the Star or the, or the Globe, but, you know, that was their headline. The statistics are staggering. They are staggering. And this comes out of our, the course that we created for physicians as well. Um, just to bring it home, this is, you know, it's, it is a, an epidemic in all kinds of ways. Take those photos and I'll <laughs> move along. But yeah, it's a good one. You know, 85% of crimes committed against women in Canada are committed by people we know, okay? or they know. I think I'll, you know, you can get these two. We'll make sure, but, and I'm gonna, we've already heard uh, this information, which I, I'm just gonna pass along. Margaret and I were in different countries when we <laughs> were planning this. So I, I figured we'd have some overlap here. I just want to talk a bit about intersectionality because not all women experience violence in the same ways, and that's part of the legacy of, of settler colonialism. It's part of you know the oppression that people um, experience. So I don't know why it's doing this funny thing, but Indigenous women, for example, six times the rate of domestic violence uh, uh, than um, non-Indigenous women women who live with cognitive and physical disabilities, two to three times more, immigrant women, um, more vulnerable for a number of reasons, including um, it could be language, could be not knowing about services, um, and for everyone, I mean, I think hanging over all people who, you know, have to reach out for help or where help is identified as a need for them, the shame, the shame. and. One of the things I learned around, um, and, and I'm not putting them down as a, in the intersectional group, but around affluent women, is that the shame and you should have known and how could you not have known and you know, you're a physician or you're, uh, you're highly educated and you make a good living, how is that possible? So you know, shame is really you know, prevalent. Well, and they also may not need to. They could perhaps afford a vacation, so there may be some mitigating opportunities there, but ultimately you're returning to a place uh, where there's violence and threats. Um, good point. Um, and uh, elder abuse uh, as well, 60% of senior survivors of domestic violence, and LGBTQ communities, and the prevalence, um, you know, the risks for people who are trans, again, because of the oppression they experience and they're twice as likely to self-report ever experiencing intimate partner violence compared to the average rate experienced by cisgender women. So it's very high, so they're very vulnerable. Um, I want to show you, nothing's happening. <laughs> I'm pressing the green, okay. Just to, I think it's really important that you look at like the work that you're doing and what are the values under it. So in healthcare, it's very easy because we want to talk about, we talk about health impact, it's so prevalent, it's very visible. But if you think about how do you connect this message and this information to people in your organizations? Um, so, I mean, you have union membership, there's many things you can talk about, but if you're, if you're talking um, to folks in the transportation sector, you're talking to folks in communication, how can you bring this, how can you connect with what's important and, and the heart um, of the work that they're doing. 
So just to, to think about that. And of course, you know, nobody goes into healthcare to see people get hurt. And what we have to do is, you know, keep our eyes open and become alert to, you know, not saying this couldn't be happening to this person because, you know, that doesn't happen to them or whatever. And also just to, to watch some of the assumptions and beliefs that we bring to all of these encounters around, you know, who people are and who we, who we, who we are and, and who they are as well. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving along here, and I'm not going to, this is again some of that great material that comes out of um, making it our business. So I just want, to, these are the kinds of things that staff need to know. So just to kind of keep it, you know, really basic, you know, who do I talk to when I see warning signs or risk factors? So my colleague, I think, is experiencing domestic violence. Where do I go? Everybody needs to know that. Know, who do I go and talk to about that? And what skills and knowledge do they have? And what's the levels of confidentiality around this? Because I don't want this, I don't want to get in trouble for bringing this forward. But we want a culture where nobody sits there thinking, I know this, but I'm not going to tell anybody in the organization because they don't want me to. And that's tough. I mean, that's, a, that's tough. And I've been in those situations where I have had colleagues who I knew were experienced, and I had to say to them, I know this is happening, we have to do a plan, and I need to call CAS, which is our Children's Aid Society, because I, you know, there are children in the home where violence is occurring and we're required to contact them as well. Can we sit together and have that call? I will be here, and if you want me to leave the room while you're talking to them, I will, be, I will do that, but it needs to happen, okay? So some really tough work and again using the kinds of resources that you have to support you um, we're really lucky because we had a team of us who you know would do this as part of our work around harassment discrimination violence workplace violence but um, in a lot of organizations all of that support isn't there but there were certainly times where we felt I want to double check this I want to talk to somebody who has a lot of expertise we would call us also, also call Barb McQuarrie and uh, and tap her knowledge and insight and that was always very helpful and again you may want to look at external threat assessors as well how do I report if I see an incident and who else do I need to know about my responsibilities at work okay. for managers um, there's a different responsibility legally um, in terms of the workplace and also they're there to take care of everybody so just again some steps that need that should be taken uh, when there's a ma by managers when there's a disclosure or when they believe that there's a, a harassment or discrimination okay I'm gonna give you a little case study here so an anonymous voice message left on your phone they think one of your employees is being abused by the partner want to let you know they provide the name and employee what are the issues what steps do you take? What do you, what would you do? Anybody? Would you, because it's anonymous, you wouldn't do anything? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the time, the, it comes from someone who comes forward or it comes from usually a manager detects some of the signs that you saw earlier and that will come forward but we also allow for anonymous ha had allowed for anonymous reporting um, and that you know if we didn't know who it was we would still follow up and that's the same with harassment that's if you get a you know anonymous harassment complaints etc or that violence had occurred you would look into those as well it's not some a precedent you want to set where people you know don't identify themselves and it's pretty rare but just to say that that is also a possibility okay I'm going to show you a very quick you're going to show them these wonderful <laughs> folks are going to show this is available on YouTube there's two videos one and it's by, uh, by the British Columbia thank you yeah and they're really nice little training videos this one is on how to, to have that conversation with an employee. So, and the second one is around how to do safety planning. Okay, we're just going to watch this one. Alex, I'm worried about you. You're a great worker, but lately you seem distracted. Is it okay to talk about my personal problems at work? If you tell me what's wrong, maybe I can help. I didn't want to bring it up at work, but my partner is hurting me at home. 
That's so hard to believe. Does my boss think I'm lying? How do you put up with this? Does he think it's my fault? You should leave your partner. <sighs> if only it were that easy. Alex, I'm worried about you. You know you're a great worker, but lately you seem distracted. If you tell me what's wrong, maybe I can help. I didn't want to bring it up at work, but my partner is hurting me at home. Oh, no. I'm sorry to hear that. Would you like to talk about it? Is there any point in talking about this at work? You know, we have policies that can help keep you safe at work. It would be such a relief to feel safe while I'm here. Look, here's a list of resources for people dealing with domestic violence. I'm here to listen anytime, okay? You're not alone. Maybe there is hope. Okay. And I, I think probably any of us who do this work in organizations, what we often hear is that this is the only place I felt safe. And I feel so supported here. So, you know, 98% of the, of the people who come forward or who, we are, who come through this process actually feel that this is actually a great relief. And um, they can focus on their jobs. They can keep their jobs, which is really important, um, especially if, you know, with the benefits and, and just, you know, to have a place where you can come to every day and keep things as, as, uh, as much in the, as they have been as you can. I just want to, I have two more slides that I want to share with you. I know we saw this, but I just want to, I want to get, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person beside you and just re read the sentence and say it to them like you mean it. Okay? Can you just do that? Just turn to the person beside you and do that. You're just going to read this to them. Yeah. Okay. Sort of get a chance to do that? Not yet? Yeah. How'd that go? How'd that feel? Well, you're advanced. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Oh, you felt good to hear that. That's great. So a lot of times, I'll be honest, when we ask people to do this, it's very uncomfortable for them to say those sentences. So think about that when you're, I mean, you're, you are advanced. Um, so when you are working with people who aren't used to having these kinds of conversations, you know, um, and maybe don't interact at this kind of level with people all the time. You want them to try this. You want to talk about what felt uncomfortable for them and what felt good. If, if you, know, you know, being on the receiving end, did it feel good or did it feel invasive? Just, so just those two sentences is a way to start to build the skills and knowledge around this wonderful see it, you know, check it, name, see it, name it, check it, right? So. Um, just to start to practice that and, you know, have a discussion about what feels and what doesn't feel okay. Um, to get to slide 27, which is a ways away, do I have to just click my way through really fast? Okay, well, all right, here we go. Because <laughs> um, there's something I just, oh, this, sorry, I just want to go back. So one thing, workplace safety planning, these are some of the things that you can include in that, which are quite, you know, important. You can put into place ways to screen calls. You can look at changing emergency contact information, uh, escorts to and from vehicle. We've talked about that. Move their parking spot closer, right, and somewhere visible. Um, relocating workstations so that they are in a place where they are either back far where they're going to have to go through a number you know somebody entered they would be very safe or somewhere you know actually moving it 
does the partner know where they work? Like, do they know the location of their desk or their office or their station or whatever, right? Do they know their routine? Maybe they don't. Um, so those are the kinds of questions you want to, you know, check out check out when you do that. Panic buttons are, are good. They're not, you know, we don't want people to just feel that's going to be the answer to everything. What is the security response if you have one? How long is it going to take if somebody pushes a panic button? Um, what are the communication procedures in terms of if there is an issue and, you know, who knows about uh, uh, who has photographs, etc. Notifying police a possibility. Again, something that happened by us very rarely. And then um, cleanse at switchboard, the intranet, the internet. We help people do a, a check to see where they might exist anywhere in the internet and help them to clean that up. We have uh, you know, directions and information that you can pull off the internet in terms of helping people to do that. So just some ideas around that practical piece. Communicating, we've talked about that. So again, you see violence against, so you know, how can violence against women be uh, an issue in your workplace and how can you bring that forward? This is the information that I thought would be just important to close with is what what staff and managers need. So yeah, by all means, you can take a photograph here. What do you do if you're experiencing it? What do you do if someone lets you know that they're experiencing it? Who do you contact for help? What's the process? So do you have an algorithm? Can you do a little drawing, an infographic or something that says this is, you know, you know, you tell your ma the manager will know, security will know, will know, you know, and and you can sit down again when you meet with people to explain. It's not that everybody's going to read all of this. They need it when they want it when they need it. Okay, when you have an employee or a colleague or um, or it's your own experience. What policies apply? Put those together there. You can do a wonderful web page with all this information that's just there at a click. Especially if you happen to be in 24/7 environments, it can be accessible even if you're not there. Right? Okay. Is there training? How do I get that training? And you know, maybe you have an online course that people could take a look at, or maybe there's resources again at, that you could link people to at Making It Our Business, which is terrific. And then external resources and links, you want to have those as well, to those shelters, to places that people can get immediate help, help, etc. So I think my time is probably I'm up. Yeah, thank you very much, and I hope that some of these um, were helpful to you. We might have a few minutes. Um, I wanted to say also that um, it was a great experience for us working with Marilyn at Mount Sinai Hospital. The first time we went in and we did a two-day training with your senior team, and it was like the, some of the first conversations that had happened, I think, between people working in different parts of the organization about what will we do if this happens. And then I went back a couple of years later, and we did another two-day training with a senior leadership team. And um, and frontline folks and frontline folks, yeah. And yeah. and uh, we did a facilitator training so that you had people within yeah. the organization able to do uh, the one-hour um, basic information. Uh, and and it was so amazing to watch the sort of the the grow. It's like building a muscle, right? Like you have to actually practice, and it takes experiences mm -hmm. to figure out how it will all work but the experience does build and when I went I think it was the second time there was a flow chart about if yeah. this then that here's what people can expect and what a sense of confidence there was in the room from people who um, had created something together right that people could rely on so you don't start there it takes time but you know, it's sort of like a baby step kind of approach. Little steps add up, especially when it's clear what the goals are and what it is you want to achieve with every interaction. It has to be simple and it has to be doable. One thing, one piece on that is that um, you might want to look at a domestic violence committee. And that's, you know, a really powerful space. We actually, you know, ran symposiums for the whole like external community as well, um, brought in people with expertise, like, um, like folks from um, making it our business, and also just people who would talk about, you know, for example, how do you document this information? You know, could you, could you be called to speak in court, for example, and produce your notes? And so just some of the things that arise over time, questions, and you want to, you know, share that with other people in the community who have uh, similar responsibilities as well. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you.